In previous vision space presentations, we've looked at how we can develop strategies depicting the differential between optical record and experiential vision. The camera acts as a filter between the real world and us. Here I want to look more closely at the effect that the mirror has. It too acts as a filter, and what we take from a reflection is not what we would take from an encounter with the real setting. The proposition is that understanding the differential helps us to explain just why it is that a vision space painting reflected in a mirror becomes noticeably more salient or immersive. The reflection of the painting is more immersive precisely because the rest of the reflected view, the rest of the environment, is impoverished by contrast. The vision space painting of the still life and the mirror image will capture the differential where the photographic record will not. In previous presentations, the structure of vision space is discussed in detail, and we can see how perceptual space is set out according to an underlying perceptual structure that we as biological organisms generate. This structure includes an implicit form of spatial awareness developed from an all-possibilities potential to form a field-like structure centred on a fixation point that we establish within the scene. In this still life, I deploy a range of dot sizes that incrementally increase in the X, Y and Z directions from the selected fixation on the candelabra. This strategy of space depiction establishes the perceptual field and with it an awareness of relative proximity. Firstly, we establish the landscape visible outside the studio, then the broader context of the room, and then start to define the local countertop environment of the still life arrangement and then we can start to explore and tighten within that skeleton. The reflected still life arrangement does not operate on this basis. Here we set out the marks that donate space in just the X, Y dimensions. Critically, the Z consideration is absent. Ever wondered why it's difficult to judge distances from a mirror? It's because the Z component is missing. The mirror is an object within the real setting, a flat one. It presents a spatial plane to the viewer. The only Z value in the light arriving at the viewer is that of the mirror plane itself and is not associated with the reflected scene. The reflected scene may be clearer, i.e. less noisy than the direct view of the scene, but it lacks the implicit spatial saliency. All of this strongly suggests that this implicit form of spatial awareness relies on a coherence function embedded within the light array. For the theory relating to this, please refer to the papers and presentations listed at the end. I also need to point out that in order to illustrate this, I have set up two fixation points within the painting, one on the direct rendition of the candelabra and the other on its indirect form in the mirror. This inevitably sets up some conflicts in the values of the respective renditions of the fields that require compromises. I will point out some of these later. I want to move on now to show the painting reflected in the mirror and to consider the differential between a photograph of this and an experiential encounter of it. The experiential encounter of this scenario is very engaging. The photographic encounter is less so. Firstly, we see the still life setup, then the reflection of the still life setup, then the vision space encounter with the real setting, and finally, the vision space painted encounter with the mirror reflecting the still life setup. So in the photographic version, we can see the optical picture space version of the real setting, the optical reflection in the mirror, which is broadly speaking picture space as well, then the vision space realization of the experiential encounter, and finally, the vision space realization of the reflection, which we can call mirror space with its 2D field structure. The experience of standing in front of this situation is far clearer and more engaging. All I can do to convey this is to change some of the notation for you. We essentially have just two scenarios, the direct experience of the encounter and its depiction as a vision space painting, and the associated experience and depiction of its reflection. They are quite easy to equate with one another. It's both engaging and compelling. Obviously this does nothing for infinite regression scenarios and the idea that feedback loops are involved in perception. Such phenomenon can of course be crafted in current virtual reality type environments and also carefully constructed mirrored environments. And yes, they're bound to be to some extent disorientating and perplexing. 
Now going back to the compromises that arise as I render the two fields resulting from setting two fixation points in one painting. Behind the candelabra I record the surface of the mirror with large round marks as it's some distance from that fixation point, the bottom arrow. With respect to the second fixation, the same location requires smaller marks as distance is now realised in terms of a 2D plane, top arrow. In the case of the mirror frame to the left, the two spatial distances from the respective fixation points are broadly equivalent, and so the size of the marks are consistent and match one another. The same is not true at the top of the frame, as it's closer to the fixation made in the mirror. I would also like to quickly refer to the prevailing function of the original depiction of the All Possibilities field within the final version of the painting. In complex areas, this underpainting can become obliterated as revisions pile upon revisions. We end up with just multiple spatial values, one on top of the other. I then have to reinstate the field. This artificial rendition is never as good as the areas that have naturally evolved to contain these relationships, but it's essential to do so. They contribute to the saliency of the local area, and so to the overall impact of the work. This field resonates within the painting. The other marks that depict the observed scene reference within the perceptual space that the underpainting sets out. Having said that, I also want to mention paintings where I've experimented with not completing the underpainting by leaving out the Prussian blue dots. In the painting of Nelson Mandela, I realised that there were going to be large areas that needed to remain black, and so the blue dots would potentially interfere too much. In the case of this still life, I want to deploy the absolute minimum of marks to see what would happen. The flow of spatial referencing dots comes in from the walls, getting smaller across the floor, then up the counter sides, across the countertop to the coffee pot, and then finally up to the fixation point on its lid. In both cases, I think it's possible to imply the all possibilities field by its absence. We now need to touch on the other aspects of the painting, identifying some of the compositional aspects of phenomenal field. Again, much of this is contained in other vision space presentations, so I'll try to keep this fresh. There are inner crescents, where right and left eye views can alternate over time to provide saliency through disparity. In paintings that don't attempt to depict the entirety of phenomenal field, these then come into play. The crescent shapes are largely indicative, but do derive from experiential detection. So we can clearly see how the influences of both eye views are integrated. The blue lines are contributions from the left eye, and the red, the right. Notice the splice horizontally down the centre through the fixation area. The painting just illustrates one potential arrangement of information within central vision and the crescents. On an experiential basis, this is a fluid and dynamic situation, not fixed and static as in the painting. If we then consider for a moment central vision and fixation, we can explore what happens at the radius of central or macular vision. I looked at this many years ago in this triptych. The central vision area is an autonomous region expressed as a volume in space and exists within the entirely different data potential of peripheral vision. This is a monocular view. It differs to the binocular view rendered in this still life. We can see that the stem of the candelabra contains both a left and right eye view that thickens the stem as the lines diverge and establish two profiles for the base. I should also explain the development in mark making. If we return to the Mandela paintings, we can see that in the central vision area I have deployed an increasingly square-edged brushstroke system emanating radially from the fixation point in this case the mouth. This allows me to progress from a detailed photographic type form of rendering into a carefully regulated system of noise depiction through size of brush mark. I can preserve aspects of detail within this system for longer. This close range system then gives way to the individual round marks that can be used to indicate increasing noise in relation to distance from fixation. This can be seen operating in this still life and in vision space moving image media, developed using the vision space post-production software. 